Okay, G, tell us about sum of squares as a way to quantify error around a model. What does that mean? All right, so it always helps to get started with a pretty concrete set of data to talk about. So let's start with our tiny fingers, right? So these are just six little thumb lengths right here in millimeters. And I've also put student ID. This is just student one, two, three, four. And you could see for student one, their thumb length is 56 millimeters for student two, it's 60, and so on and so forth. And then I'm gonna show you in kind of a scatter plot, right? So this scatter plot, it has ID on the x-axis, and we don't really care about their ID, but it just spreads it out a little so you can see it. Um, and here's thumb on the y-axis, which we really care about. And you could see this dot represents student one's thumb. And remember student one had 56 millimeter thumb. And so that's student one's thumb. Here's student two's thumb, and they're 60 millimeters, and student three, and student four, and so on and so forth, right? All right, so let's start first by creating a model around these set of data. So let's create a model right here by clicking on Show Movable Line. And you could see that it creates a model for me, a very simple model, right? And this model is quite dumb because it is gonna predict everyone is just the mean, 62. And notice, Nobody's thumb length is actually 62. But remember what was great about the mean? What was great about the mean was that it balanced the error. So I'm going to show you that error by clicking on sh show residuals. So this is the error off of this model, right? And so you could see that for student one's thumb, this is how much error is off the mean. Right? And so you could see that the mean is quite nice because it seems to balance the errors above the mean as well as below, on the positive side and the negative side. Right, But this little app is quite nice because we don't have to just have the mean as our simple model. We can move this line around. And so we could move it up and we could say, hey, I want this really big number, 66.65. I want that to be our model. And I can move it down. And I can make something really small, like 56.21. I can make that my model, right? And notice that these are really terrible models because you don't balance the residuals on both sides. There we had a lot of positive residuals without a lot of negative ones. And here I want to point out one thing. Um, remember we've been writing these little word equations and then we started writing little tiny general linear model equations, right? And I wanna show you that right here. This is like our general linear model equation. This is thumb, we're try that's what we're trying to predict, right? Thumb length equals, and in this case the mean, 62, plus some other stuff. You don't have to worry about that other stuff right now, but we'll leave it in there. All right, so now let's think about total error, right? Because now we see there's error in this data set for every single data point. But what about the total error around this model, right? Well, we already talked about why we can't just add up all the residuals because if the mean is your model and the residuals are perfectly balanced, they will zero out. They will cancel each other out, right? Well, what about adding up all the absolute error? And that's what this SAE is right here, sum of absolute error. In the text, we also talk, it, talk about it as SAD, the sum of absolute deviation. So those two are the same thing. And so here we show you what it's doing is it's taking each of these deviations or residuals, taking the absolute value of them and then adding them all up. And when we do that, the sum is 18. Right? And think about what units that is. We haven't done anything special. So these are just in millimeters. So it's 18 millimeters, right? We've also talked about sum of squares, right? And so literally we're gonna take each of these residuals and create squares out of them. And we could do that mathematically by squaring it and we could do it visually by drawing squares, right? And so here we've drawn the squares for you. And so the sum of squares will be the sum of the area of each of these squares. Wait a minute, gee, how did you know where to draw the square? Ah, good question. So notice with this line right here, this is the residual, right? What does it mean when we square that residual? We take that residual and we draw a square right around it. So our dot, our dot for student one was here. And from there we draw the residual and then we also draw the horizontal line and we draw a square in that way. 
So the bigger the residual, it's always going to be a bigger square. That's right. So the bigger the residual, the bigger square, and the more big squares you have in your sum of squares, the bigger your sum of squares, right? And so we're looking for a sum of squares or a measure of error that is minimized by your model, right? And the nice thing about the mean as a model is that it minimizes the sum of squares. Now you might be thinking. What does that mean? <laughs> What does it mean that the sum of squares is minimized by the mean? Well, I'm going to actually show you. So let's take a look at what our sum of squares. So here, right here, SSE is sum of squared error, right? That's the same thing as sum of squares, right? And so that number is 82. So if we added up the area of all these squares, that's 82. Now, what if our model was some other number other than the mean, right? And so we can move that model up and down. Right? So let's move it up just a little bit, and let's look at our sum of squares. So now our model is not the mean, so it's something slightly bigger than the mean. It's 63 instead of 62. And look at our sum of squares. Our sum of squares is now 90.92. That's bigger than 82, right? And we could move it up a little bit more. Let's see what happens. Let's move our model up a little more, and notice that the as as The model moves away from the mean. You could literally see the squares. They're huge. <laughs> These squares are really huge, and because of that, the sum of squares is also much bigger, right? Now, what if we move down past the mean? So here we're still above the mean. Remember, 62 was our mean. So watch that sum of squares. Is it? We're coming down. We're coming down. We're coming down. There's, there's our mean. 82, uh, and if we go even just a little past, a little past the mean, we see that our sum of squares starts to go up right away, right? And you could see that visually also with the squares, right, G getting bigger. So now let's return to the mean, right? So here's our mean, which minimizes the sum of squares. But why sum of squares? Doesn't sum of absolute error seem perfectly nice, right? Um, well, let's see what is problematic about the sum of uh, sum of absolute error. So, if we move this around, notice that 18 is the sum of absolute error at the mean. But it turns out that for a bunch of different numbers, 18 is the sum of absolute error, right? And so because of that, the sum of absolute errors isn't uniquely minimized by the mean. The mean isn't the only number that minimizes it. It's minimized by a whole bunch of numbers, right? Um, whereas the sum of squares is uniquely minimized by the mean. So the mean and the sum of squares have a special relationship. They, they kind of hook together in a particular way, where if you want to minimize the sum of squares, use the mean as your model. If you want to use the mean as your model and you're looking for some, some form of error that is uniquely minimized by it, you use the sum of squares.